Welcome all of you to the documentation tutorial here at EuroBSDCon. Let's make manuals more useful is the motto for today. And I'm going to cover a relatively wide range of topics related to BSD system documentation. Um, some of the material is drawn from my two BSD Canada presentations three years ago and this May. But the focus today is more in actually hands-on getting stuff done than like in the BSD Canada talks, more technical stuff like how it was implemented and how it was integrated into systems. So today we are focusing on how do we really make manuals more useful. I'll get to a, um, a t kind of table of contents a bit later. Um, well, what is this? Yeah. If we want to make manuals more useful, then of course, is the very first thing we must understand what are requirements for good documentation. When is documentation good? Two things are really completely obvious. Documentation needs to be correct and it needs to be complete. What is sometimes overlooked is that it also needs to be concise because if it's lengthy and wordy, then you lose a lot of time reading it and sometimes don't even find what you, what you need. The Git manuals, for example, are a good example of a documentation violating that. Um, another point that is often overlooked is that documentation should ideally be all in one place, easy to find and easy to access. The typical way to violate that is to put your documentation on the web, then people have to search for it first, and even if they find it, they will wonder whether it corresponds to the version of the software they are actually running. So make it easy to find. Also, it is not just plain text. Uh, software documentation typically contains lots of keywords from different languages that in some way should be marked up so that they stand out, that their function becomes clear. It should be easy to read, in particular if everybody adheres to a uniform style for display and markup, it, it gets easier for users to, to get used to the style. And also if people it, would adhere to a uniform style of writing it, it would get easier for people to edit documentation, which is quite important to get it written in the first place. So the formatted documentation should seem easy to users. The language to write it should seem easy to, easy to programmers. And remember, if there is no documentation, the code is almost unusable. And if it's badly documented, that's about as bad as bad code, because do what you want. From the user's perspective, basically what users see is one tool, the man command they are typing. It finds the manuals in the file system, it transparently calls a formatter on them and it displays the formatted text, typically somewhere in the pager. You may consider that trivial, but actually this is exactly the point where during the last few months there has been considerable progress. Because now, since about August, so since about last month, we have one unified user interface for all of this, where formerly several different tools, apropos for searching, MAN for steering the whole process, MANDOC or NROF for formatting were required. There is no, you can now access all that functionality from just the MAN command with one set of options. You don't need to learn various other commands. Um, I'll get to that in more detail. Semantic searching, so things like I want to search for cross-references or for function names or something like that, is available in production basically since April this year. And the new online interface containing the complete search functionality of the command line tool is online on the first Maya site since July this year. So even though this sounds completely trivial, Exactly here, progress has been made. From the perspective of 
manual writers, which are typically programmers, so typically not, pe in, especially in open source software, typically not people focusing on writing manuals. It should be easy to write. It should be easy to diff. Um, the source code of the manual, as opposed to the manual when formatted for the user, should also be easy to read and change. Of course, it must support semantic markup. It should readily produce various output formats and it should be easily portable. Quite a list of requirements. Um, we, that is, both Chris Dubbs and myself, who wrote and maintain the Mandoc toolbox, and also the OpenBSD developers recommend to use one simple versatile language for all of that, which is the MDoc language. I will get into more detail about that later, what it is, how it works. It is a language with a long tradition. It is based on the, on the ROF language that was invented in 1964, 50 years ago. It is the successor to the MAN traditional manual language that was used since, uh, since the 70s, since the first version of Unix, actually. It was originally designed beginning of the 90s for 4.4 BSD. And it, nowadays, it's mainly ma uh, implemented both in Mandoc and in Groff in a very compatible way. So it doesn't really matter which of the two tools you use, you always get the same output. Um, also, it's not, not really an arcane or niche thing. It's used as the default language by all the major BSDs and since this year also by Illumos, which, which is quite surprising. They switched in one single commit from not having it at all, not even as an option, to using it by default for everything. Now, uh, to get a bit, uh, a bit of a taste and to be a bit of historical background, I'm showing a few historic slides. Let's start with a birthday celebration. We have half a century, almost exactly half a century, of Roth tradition now. It was in 1964 that Jerry Saltzer at MIT, writing his thesis, was tired of typing and retyping on a mechanical typewriter and invented a language to have his thesis typeset on the computer, which was called Runoff, later renamed to Roth. And the formatting requests, many of the formatting requests he implemented and invented are still used today in, in modern RAF. Um, the, the machine you see here is the computer he was using, an IBM mainframe. Now, that guy is advertising something that is 50 years old. Why do we still use it? Sounds strange. Here you have some source code. Actually, the source code of the next slide I'm, I'm going to show. The slides you see here are written in Roth. Um, you see, most of it is just text. You can read it almost as if it were just a text file. But in between, you have these formatting commands, requests and macros. Like here, it's saying it's beginning a list. It has a list item. And also some of it is physical formatting, make it a bit bigger or have a bit of space in between. So that's, that can easily be hand edited. So that's how it, the former slide looks when it's formatted. Uh, it looks unobtrusive. It doesn't hide or muddle the actual text. It harmonizes very well with diff, quite to the contrary if you were doing it in XML. It allows high quality output in multiple formats. It works with simple, fast, portable, readily available tools, and there is no heavyweight or cumbersome tool chains anywhere in the vicinity. In particular, you don't need any kind of XML for doing that. In, in one word, keep it stupidly simple. That's, that's really important. Because neither the people, that's what you always need to keep in mind, neither the people 
reading the documentation nor the people writing them want to focus on the documentation. They want to focus on the content or on the programming. Now, I've talked a bit about the rough language, but how did it happen that it became connected to manuals, to documentation? That goes back to the very first new version of Research Unix. These are Ken Thompson and uh, Dennis Ritchie with their PDP-11 computer at Bell Labs. And when they prepared the first version, they rewrote ROF in PDP-11 assembler and used that to format their manuals. Um, the section headers they introduced, name, synopsis, description, and so on, are still in use today. They were the right thing right from the start. Then, in later versions of Research Unix, since V4, they had macros that were a bit like what we have today. And in V7, the MAN language was actually invented. That is still the main language used today for the Linux manual page project. The BSDs are no longer using it. They are a bit more modern, but Linux manual pages are still using the 1979 um, language from Bell Labs. Um, you might wonder, OK, now he's arrived in the 70s. Was there any progress in the last 35 years? And yes, indeed, there was. For 4.4 BSD, the nearly final Berkeley release, a new formatting language was invented mainly to support semantic markup. And Cynthia Livingstone of uh, Usenix rewrote all the BSD manuals from MAN to MDoc, which is the, the basis of the manuals we are still using today for the basic system utilities. That language has considerable expressive power. We will see some examples later for semantic markup. It works in practice as a standalone language. So when you are writing your manuals with MDoc, you only need MDoc and nothing else. By contrast, if you are using the older MAN language, then you regularly need low-level ROF instructions in between because that language is not complete, not standalone. Consequently, an MDoc document is much easier on the eye than a MAN do document. It has a more uniform view to it. And also portability is no longer an issue because even if you are writing documentation for a, a legacy system that doesn't have MDoc support, the MANDoc toolbox provides a converter. I'll get to more detail later. Uh, and of course, the, the semantic markup you get with this MDoc language facilitates semantic searching, which will also be one of the main topics of this tutorial. This is some sample MDoc code. Again, you see most of it is just plain text, but then in between you have semantic instructions. Like here it is inserting the name of the utility. Here it has an internal cross-reference to another section. Here it has an external cross-reference to another manual page. And there is a prologue. We'll, we'll get to more detail just to have a first impression. To summarize, um, regarding the classic documentation formats, three things really, the ROF, input syntax, the MDoc, semantic markup, and the MAN, presentational output format, have proven timeless because they are so simple and so efficient. Many people have tried to come up with a better concept but basically all of these alternative concepts failed in some way or other. The most uh, prominent failure probably is the info utility. Um, recently, Eric S. Raymond and uh, people say um, Richard Stallman have to agree to retire it and to replace it with something else. So, yeah. Um, now, Given that MDoc is really a good choice as a language, we need tools for it. 
Of course, the traditional tools like ROF or Heirloom uh, ROF work, but <coughs> Mandoc has a lot of advantages. Um, most of them are functional. You, you have all the functionality in one small binary. It contains all the searching facilities. It contains handling of all the input formats that typically appear in manual pages. It readily produces various output formats. It has uh, integrated support for MDoc to MAN conversion in case you need it. It includes all the various commands like mandoc, man since a few months, apropos what is, make what is. It is completely free, so in particular there is no GPL code inside. It is lightweight, in particular you don't need a C++ compiler. It is portable, it is small, much smaller than Graph actually. And it is very fast, even Graph as a typesetting system is extremely fast. Now, for manuals, you don't need a full typesetting system, so writing that thing in pure C, um, we were able to get for typical MDoc pages and that another factor of five in speed. For pages like a shell manual, you really, even on a notebook, you really notice that formatting with Mandoc is much faster than. Um, yeah. The thing those Linux guys are aim aiming at, they'll probably replace info with an ASCII doc, docbook tool chain. The few times that it, I experimented with that tool chain, it was typically for the things you, as a developer, you usually have to do after editing manual. It was typically a hundred times slower than the typical, typical things you have to do with Mandoc. That's really amazing. Um, yeah. All this, the, the basic functionality of Mandoc is no longer new. I already presented that three years ago at BSD CAN. So by now it's quite mature and you can really rely on it in production. Um, yes, so, so much for the, for the introduction, a bit of motivation, a bit of history. Let me give a brief overview what my ideas are, what we could do here together today. First, if there is a need, I'll give a small introduction to the MDoc formatting language. Then I'll show you a bit about how to use that to, um, to get manuals for portable software packages. A bit larger part will be about quality control for existing manuals. How do I approach an existing code base and check whether documentation is really okay? And after that, we can have a hands-on working phase where you really can get your, your fingers dirty experimenting with the stuff. Um, before I go on to present a bit about searching and displaying manuals, that's the newest stuff we have in this tutorial. And after the coffee break, we go to system integration. How do you need, how do you use Mandoc, the Mandoc tool set, as a documentation formatter in a base system or for ports? After that, again, we can work a bit. And then I'll wrap up about the status in the, in the BSD, status in Linux, and what should be the next steps. So I'm hoping that, that we are through at around 7, uh, at around 5.30. Good. Um, before we, we really get into it, I propose that we have a very brief introduction of ourselves just about four sentences per, per person. Just state your name, what you think your main role is, like whether you consider yourself an application programmer, a technical writer, an operating system developer, a system administrator, a BSD user, or whatever. Your project affiliation, if any, and uh, 
what are your what is your most important goal for this tutorial so maybe let let me start my name is ingo schwarze i'm the current mandoc project lead at mdocml bsd lv um, i'm also an open bsd operating system developer dabbling here and there in userland in the clip in various utilities where, wherever there is a need <coughs> And my goal for today is to show you the current state of the art in BSD system documentation and to help you with any questions you might have in that area. Now, I planned to say that it's not really a good idea that I start because the person who should really start this and who actually started this is Christoph Johnsons. I think he will, he will arrive at the latest for the working phases, and then maybe we can... Uh, he's the guy who wrote Mandoc originally, um, and he will be around for the working phases for your questions too. But yeah, let's perhaps just... and uh, web developer. 
system administrator and uh, writing long and complicated shell scripts and I want to be able to document my work so that the colleagues can via man um, see uh, what I've done for them. Okay. That's good. I'm uh, a system administrator, sometimes software developer. Okay. Yeah, so if I go back to, to this page, then as far as I understand, these, uh, the, f the first two points are probably really important for most of you. So I it would perhaps make sense that I expand a bit on those. And uh, these two are probably not so important because I understand there are no really FreeBSD or NetBSD operating system developers around, so you are not uh, not likely to switch those systems tomorrow to use some different basic tools. But uh, I, I, I'll not cut that out completely because uh, many of you said that you are interested in learning how the how the basics work and how stuff fits together and of course those are points where you you can learn a bit but maybe we should uh, we should make this this phase a bit longer so you can really get used to it yeah okay good so writing manuals how many of you already edited a manual page at some point in their life. So took an existing manual page and changed something in it. One or two, okay, not three, yeah. Not very many. How many of you already wrote a manual page from scratch? So starting from nothing and wrote a completely new one? Nobody, okay, so getting the the basics is really important, I think. How many of you knew before coming here that there are two completely different languages for writing manuals, MAN and MDOC? Okay, most of, oh, half of you knew that. Interesting, yeah. Okay, yeah, so let's, let's get started with the, with the basics of the MDoc language. Of course, there are long introductions, tutorials, manuals about this m language, but the basic concepts you need to understand before you um, can start writing almost fit on one slide. So my goal here is that as, far as, uh, as fast as we can, we get to really write stuff down and try it out and to learn it that way. But what you do need to know before is the distinction of text lines and request macro lines. So the request macro lines starting with the dot. I already mentioned that a few times. If you have a macro line, the macro, in this case the section header .sh macro, can have arguments. The arguments follow the macro and are separated by white space. So here you have an example of a macro with one argument and here the last one you have an example with two arguments. Um, the dot, the full stop ending the sentence is here actually put as a separate argument so that the formatter understands 
that it has to, to put it right after the formatted version of the output of this, um, this macro. That's quite typical. If you have punctuation, you usually put the punctuation as the last argument on the preceding macro line. Um, in case the arguments to the macro contain white space that would otherwise delimit arguments, you can quote the whole argument and all this will be taken as a single argument here to the to function argument macro. So you need to distinguish text lines and macro lines. You need to understand that macros can optionally take arguments, not all do. Some go without arguments. And you need to understand that arguments are separated by white space. And in case they contain white space, you have to co quote them. Um, of course, there are lots and lots more de details about the syntax of the Roth language. Roth is actually among the more quirky languages. In case you ever need any details about the Roth language, you can look them up in the Roth manual. But for now, that should get you started on the basic syntax. So the next thing to worry about is to how structure your manual page. Um, every manual page starts with a prologue. I'll get into more detail later. And then has multiple sections. So the content of the manual page is organized into sections. I'll also get to that. Um, the prologue is actually quite, quite easy to grasp because it's always the same macros in the same order. You first put the date of the last change of the manual with the DD document date macro. Then the document title and the section number. This is now the section in the manual, like section one, user utility, section two, system calls, section three, library functions, and so on. Um, here, the document title is always in all caps, such that it looks the same in all manuals. The operating system macro is usually just left blank and filled in by the, by the operating system by default. Then you have the first section header, which is always name. So the fourth, the fourth line in every manual is always exactly the same line, .sh name. And the name section contains the name of the page again. Now in proper capitalization, it, particularly in Perl manuals, it's important to get the capitalization right here. And then a one-line description. Here you see a typical example. The CAT manual in OpenBSD was last changed July last year. It is section one, so a user utility. Uh, here you have the name in capitals. Here you have it as it stands usually and the one line description. Um, what you should remember after writing your prologue, count the lines. If you have six lines, it's probably complete. If you have less than six lines, look into the manual what you have missed. Now, after the prologue and after the name section, which is always the first section, in most manuals you have the synopsis section. The point about the synopsis section is to document only the syntax, never any semantics, just syntax. For user utilities, for section one manuals, um, most of the time, you can survive with these four macros. You obviously need the name of the utility. You most of the time have some command line flags, options, and some command line arguments. And usually some of these are optional. So here is a simple synopsis section. What you see, also see here is that there is no text inside. It's just 
semantically stating these are the arg arguments, these are the flags, this is optional, this isn't optional. So you don't describe anything here. You also don't worry about formatting. There is nothing like make this bold or make this uh, italic. Uh, it's just specifying the, the, sem uh, the, the syntax and then the formatting is done completely automatically. Um, I'll take this example to the next slide and explain a bit about the structure of the language. You see here that you actually have two macro calls on the same line. The first, as usual, with a dot in front of it. The second one, without the dot. In that case, we say the OP, the optional macro, is calling the FL, the flag macro. So the optional macro is a so-called enclosure macro. It opens a scope, and then the scope can contain some text, some other macros, and at some point the scope closes again, a bit like in SGML or XML elements that can nest. Um, the one kind of, of, of block macros are those that ex close implicitly at the end of the line. So the scope of the OP macro just extends to the end of the input line and that's it. Yeah. Uh, one other thing you see here, some macros have default arguments. Like here, the AR, the argument macro, is giving without any arguments and in the formatted output you still see file dot 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 which is what AR produces by default if you don't give arguments. So that's what you need to get started with a synopsis of a user command. If you need anything more, look into the manual. I, I'll go to get to some more detail where you can look there for what. It might be that you are not writing a manual for a user command, but for a library function. In that case, you, you need different macros in the synopsis, like include files, function declaration. Oh, hi, Chris Debs. Yeah. I'll, yeah. Um, include files, function declarations, function arguments, function types, such stuff. This is, this is the list of macros you basically need in each and every function manual page. Here is a typical example and how it will format. Um, one thing you can see here again is a block macro having a scope, this FO, but now it doesn't just extend to the end of the line, but there are multiple lines inside giving the various function arguments and it only closes when you specify the explicit companion closure macro. So there are two types of block macros, implicit one extending to the end of the lines and explicit ones going on and on until you close them explicitly. Again, a bit like in SGML or XML. In this case, the difference is that in XML you have to close everything that you open. So you always have the text clobbered with those closure macros. And here, in most cases, you get away with the implicit macros like this FA that just extends to the end of the line, so clobbers the text less. Good. Uh, now we have the prologue, the name section, the synopsis section. Now we are done with the syntax. Now we have to start to talk about semantics. And that's what the description section is for. So at the beginning of the, this, the next section is the description section. And at the beginning of the description section, the first thing you do is explain the purpose of the, uh, the utility. What is, what is this for? And then you describe the syntax and the semantics of all the features. So that's really the meat of the manual page, the description section. Be careful to be 
at the same time complete and concise. So what you should definitely not do at the beginning of a description section is talk about history. Oh, I wrote this utility because I thought it would be useful for these kinds of people. And if you want to write that, the, the proper place is right down here in the history section or somewhere. There it may be uh, interesting for people, but right at the top at the description, it's just annoying. Mm. In case your description gets very long, even though you are concise, you can split it into, into multiple sections. The typical example is a shell manual that has lots and lots of sections, but for smaller tools, you'll probably not need that, and you should stick to the standard um, section names because that makes it easier for users. If you already know which sections to expect when opening a manual page, you more easily find your way around it. Um, I'm not going to explain all these sections right now because chances are you won't remember all of them anyway. What you should know is that various information typically goes into various other sections. For example, the return value goes into a specific section and some of these sections only apply to utilities and some only apply to functions. But in case you wonder where to put some information for your specific case, again just look at the manual. It lists all those sections. It lists what typically goes into those sections and it also lists which macros to use there. So you can really look all that up at the time you need it, and then get more used to it. Okay, so now we have, we basically have seen a first overview of everything that might be needed, the preamble, the name section, the synopsis section, the description, and that there are some more sections. Now, in case we get stuck somewhere, where do we look? I already said the most important resource is the MDoc manual. When you wonder which section to use for some, for some information you want to convey, you look into the manual structure section of that manual. When you wonder which macros to use to mark up some specific syntax element, you look into a macro overview, which is basically just one page where you have all the macros that are not deprecated. Um, I should perhaps show that. I said we should a bit focus a bit more on this stuff because it will be more useful to you. So I'm typing man mdoc, which will probably show the wrong thing. Yes, it shows the mono documentation management tool, that's not what we want, so I call a man 7mdoc. That's the markup language. So here, right, the second chapter is the manual, the manual structure where it tells you which the usual ordering of the sections in a manual page is and also tells you in, in which kinds of manual pages to use or not use those sections. Then it explains the various sections. For example, right now I talked a bit about the synopsis sections because that's so important. That's really the thing people look at first. And here, even in the manual itself, you see some, some examples how to write that. Now, skipping all those sections, the very next thing you find is the macro overview. And here you have all the, uh, all the macros recommended for use. So the most important ones are typically the, the semantic markup macros. And you see the, the lists are not really that long for command line utilities, for function libraries. There you can look, I need something for this or that which one fits, and then if you have a candidate and s think that one might be good for what I'm trying to do, then you can look at the macro reference right behind how that particular macro you consider using 
what the syntax is and whether it fits to the examples given there. Uh, so that's where you usually get up to speed by trying to write something and looking at the manual to find the right. Another good way to, to get started is to just take an OpenBSD installation and look at the manuals in the base system. How did other people write documentation for similar stuff? There you will find good examples of macro usage, good examples of standard wordings, um, good examples where to put stuff and so on. Once you have written something, even if it's not yet quite complete, please run the command mandoc minus t lint on it, no matter whether you are running OpenBSD, FreeBSD, or NetBSD, or Dragonfly, or Illumos, it should always be available by default without installing anything. That catches most syntax errors, telling you in that line, in that column, something is weird in the following way, please fix it. Um, it may even provide some hints on style now and then. So up to here, it's really the standard tools that you always use. Below, it's more when, when stuff gets really difficult. In case you read the MDoc manual and still wonder, it, it doesn't seem quite clear, then sometimes the Groff MDoc manual, um, just because it has different wording, might help to get it straight. But usually um, the, the standard MDoc, our MDoc manual is stricter than the Groff one, so it's more, more to get a second view, a second angle on the same thing that might help. What may also help is Kristaps' um, full tutorial at manpages.bsd.lv. So if it turns out that you get into the habit of writing man pages, you should definitely read that at some point to, to get a full walkthrough. And if after trying all that, questions still remain, you are always welcome to ask questions on the discuss at mdocml bsd lv mailing list. Both Chris Dubs and myself are always around there and various other developers like uh, Wiz of NetBSD and Ulrich Berlein of FreeBSD. So usually we can help you there. Yeah, so this is a very important slide. By the way, when we get into the working phase, you can download these slides from the URL written on the board there. So if, if ever anything got lost, you can just look it up. What is also on that, uh, in that directory is a handout that I've um, written down that is more suited to self-study than a um, set of slides or so in full sentences. And it also contains a lot more information. It also contains the content of the previous talks. Uh, in part updated, all in, in one, um, one write-up, yeah. Okay. So, oh, yeah, that's the next, the next chapter. Any questions so far regarding how to write manual pages? Well, the question will probably come up in the hands-on working phase. Then I'd suggest before I go on to the, the next, much sh shorter section, Kristaps, would you mind shortly presenting yourself? We, we had a, a, a small um, round just saying the name, the main, um, the main role and uh, affiliation and uh, what your goal for the tutorial is so that people get to know you.
going at forward until about two years ago, maybe about two years ago. Yet. At that point, Ingo basically completely took over. Uh, so um, well, I wrote the Mad Pages uh, book. It's an e-book, actually, um, a few years ago. And also a fun history of uh, Mad Pages, which was actually really fun because I got to email people like Ken Thompson and everything. Uh, yeah. I, read, I read that one. Yeah. That's really recommended. If that is. Want, if, if you want to know more about the history of the raw tool, that's uh, that's where you should go. It's really. Yeah, uh, it is. You did the community do some great service like, by archiving that. Yeah, it was, that was fun. And then all the links were still on there, so I got to dig around and uh, like Dr. Gilroy's original original raw code uh, done in the sixties and everything, which was fun. Yeah. <laughs> So th this this is the um, the homepage for Partable Mandoc. If you ever forget it, you can just start from the OpenBSD homepage, and right here, um, besides OpenSSH and LibreSSL, you have the link to the to the MDocML page, and here um, below below history, you have the link to the history of the Unix manuals that Kristaps wrote up. Where you you can see all the all the various version of Roth that existed since the since the sixties, who wrote it and ported it to which machines. It's it's very nice stuff, yeah. Uh, well, Cynthia is the person who translated the manuals from MAN to MDoc, but I still don't know who implemented the MDoc macros originally. It, it must have been somebody of the computer systems research group. Um, I'll probably ask uh, um, Kirk what he knows about it. He's around right now, but uh, we are getting a bit off track. I think the history is interesting, but let's let's get back to uh, to writing manuals because that's what you are, you are here for. Yeah. Okay. So before we get wrong talk, before we get into the working phase, uh, yeah, a bit behind, but not badly. Um, very briefly, how do you use? MDoc and the MANDOC tool for portable manuals. So imagine you have some small software package. Of course, you are documenting it, but you expect that people are using it everywhere on, on Linux, on BSDs, on Solaris, on commercial Unixes, wherever. So in the past, it was a problem to use the MDoc language because some operating systems after 25 years still don't support it. That problem is gone. Just write your manuals in MDoc. And then if you prepare a distribution table, run mandoc minus tman once on your MDoc manual, it produces man output. And then you package up both versions. And just that at install time, the configure script decide. If, it's a, if the target system you are just now installing on Supports MDoc, install MDoc. If it doesn't, install MAN. It's basically all there is to it to, to get it portable. When I first mentioned that in a, in a conference, I thought there would be a lot to, ex to explain about it. But actually, it all fits almost on, on one slide. Let's look at it just to demonstrate how easy it is in the... Um, with the example of the first portable software package that ever did it, pseudo, maintained by Todd Miller. Um, in the project make file, there are two maintainer targets. One of the targets says, if you want to get, generate a MAN version of the pseudo manual, start from the mdoc version of the pseudo manual and run the command mandoc minus tman on it. If you want to generate a preformatted version of the manual, start 
from the MDoc version 2, mind you, not from the MAN version, from the original MDoc version, run the standard MANDOC command on it, and you get the preformatted version. Then put all that, the MDoc version, the MAN version, and the preformatted version into the distribution table. And then, long break, you put it on the website and someone downloads it and wants to install it, runs the configure script, and then what the configure script does is scan the system. Is there a Mandoc binary around somewhere? If the configure script finds Mandoc, it knows MDoc is supported, so it installs the good MDoc pages. If the configure script doesn't find Mandoc, it looks for NROF, the traditional tool for form formatting manual pages. If that isn't there either, well, it's probably Windows then, don't know, whatever, it installs the preformatted pages. Chances as people can at least read, read, uh, at, at least read uh, plain text. If it does find NROF, it tries to run NROF with the MDoc macro set. If that works, it can again install the nice MDoc pages, and if it doesn't, it falls back to the MAN pages. Now, if you want to provide a bit of sugar, you can um, provide M, uh, with MDoc or with MAN options to the configure script so that people can manually override this logic. And that's basically all. So like two lines in the project make file as maintainer targets and about a hundred lines or so to implement this logic in portable shellcode um, in the configure script. And then you can, your, you can write your manuals in MDoc and they work everywhere, even on HP Unix or Solaris 9 or whatever. Yes? That depends on your software package. So if you use autoconf, then you will do all this with autoconf macros. There are no standard ones, but you can just steal the ones from sudo. If you use something else, whatever build system you like, for example, a handwritten configure script, which works quite well. It's pro for example, what we are doing in the port portable mandoc distribution. Then you just write those tests yourself by hand, as, okay. yeah, as you wish. Good. So that's all about how to prepare portable documentation, basically. Any questions with respect to that? No? Then before getting into the, the working phase, Let's cover one more topic so that you have a bit of choice what you want to work on, quality control. So far, the situation I talked about was we have some software and no documentation yet. We are going to write documentation. Now I'm looking at something different. I, all, I not only have the software, but I also have the documentation and even documentation written in MDoc already. But now I'm wondering whether it's any good or whether it needs improvement. So, which goals do we have in quality controls for manuals? The most important first one is we have to make sure there are no fatal errors. We have to make sure each manual actually produces output when you run the formatter on it. It could crash the formatter or cause a fatal error. Even if there is some output, we have to make sure that the output actually contains all the intended text. There might be syntax errors in the manual source code that drops part of the text, so if the user looks at it, something is missing, would be bad. We have to catch severe formatting errors, like someone mistyped some width, and it's all in two columns on the far right, and it's completely unreadable. You don't want that in a manual. We should try to catch typos and st stylistic glitches, obviously. We might try to improve portability, but uh, please don't overdo that. If you try to write your manuals in a way that 
tools from the 1980s still properly format them, then your manual source code will not be quite readable. So portability is good, but not with tools from 30 years ago, please. Um, you definitely should try to get the code robust so that it doesn't, doesn't crash with small changes. Um, a quite important thing is to unify the style the manuals are displayed so that users don't get confused because each manual looks completely different than the others. You could even try to, to unify a bit the MDoc coding style such that if anybody else is ever editing the manual, the way the source code is written looks familiar and people get up to speed easily with your manuals. And last thing, um, checking the, the, the quality of existing manuals as a byproduct often finds bugs in the tools, bugs in the Mandoc formatter. So that's also a reason it's a good thing to do. Report them, by the way. Don't, don't ignore them. Um, you see these are quite different goals and quite many. So there are various tools to help with them. Of course, some of these goals can't really be automated, like finding stylistic problems, wording problems in the manuals. That's a manual task. You really need to use your judgment. The most important tool is mandoc-tlint. Um, how does that work? Ah, OK, no, one thing, one thing before that. mandoc-tlint doesn't produce formatted output, but it produces error and warning messages. Or even better, if you have a good manual, it doesn't produce anything at all. Um, now it's important to, to really get those warning and error messages right. It's, it's obvious you don't want fatal errors, because then if the user tries to format the manual, there's no output, it doesn't work at all. So we are trying to minimize that. When Mandoc started in 2008, 2009, we had lots and lots of fatal errors. So it, even on real-world manuals, it often happened that you typed Mandoc this manual, and then you got fatal error and no output. And that's, of course, almost as bad as no, having no manual in the first place. That doesn't happen anymore, um, or hardly ever. But even if you don't have fatal errors, um, it's important that if something is wrong in a manual, it's really reported because otherwise people won't realize and uh, can't fix it. On the other hand, reporting too many errors and warnings is bad as well because then users get annoyed and just switch the whole thing off and don't use it. So it's, a, it's a kind of a small... Um, small ridge, you can fall down to the one side, be too wordy, or fall down to the other side um, and fail to report what is important. And it's even worse, you can fall down both sides at once, fail to report the important stuff, but report lots of unimportant things. That, was, that happened to Mandok in the beginning too. But uh, we have done several cleanups um, again and again improved the messages. So by now, almost nothing that is reported is false positives. Some of the, um, the warnings may be ignored in some cases, but uh, most, most are really real. And a, a wide range of problems is caught. Yeah. And uh, by the way, all this applies to almost any software. So if you have any software reporting warning and errors, you always have this, this problem that you need to really need to report everything that is wrong, but you shouldn't be too wordy. And one thing people sometimes do in, in that respect is to add switches. So they invent 20 warning classes that can be individually switched on and off. Compilers are a great example of that. It's a very bad idea because nobody will remember all those switches. People will get annoyed, will not really use them. Try, 
try to get as few switches as possible that it just works, that it just reports what is uh, relevant. In, in Mandoc, we have exactly three levels that can be selected. Select only fatal errors, that's the default. Select errors, so something is severely misformatted or information is lost. Or show all warnings, but no more switches. Yeah. So, you come in with a large code base, say the whole FreeBSD operating system, and you wonder, what could I improve here? The first thing is you should do is run this command, tlint wfatal overall manuals. And hopefully, none of the manuals will trigger an error at that level. If any do, that is what you should fix th first, because those are the manuals that can't be looked at at all. Um, in case you are just looking at a handful of manuals, you can skip that step. Those fatal errors will show up in the next step anyway. By now, there is basically only one class of fatal errors left, and all those are related to file inclusion. So there are two types of file inclusion. One is the unsafe BD file macro, which means just include a file verbatim from the operating system. That is not supported by Mandoc on purpose because it is unsafe. We want Mandoc to be safe for a system administrator to run in a root shell even when there are bystanders. So now if a malicious user writes a manual that contains um, an instruction, please include the master password file here, verbatim, and tricks the system administrator to run Mandoc on that bad manual, while looking over his shoulder, he will see the encrypted passwords. So we don't support BD file, and if your manual con um, contains that, Mandoc will abort. Similarly, um, the rof.so file inclusion request, which is extensively used by the xorg manuals is only supported in the way need, actually needed, that is, only with relative parts not involving going up to parent directories for the same reason. We don't want to include sensitive files. So that's basically the only kind of fatal errors left that you might encounter in practice. Uh, by the way, these, these mountains here are the ones that give the name to this room, so this kind of fatal room, Pirin. Uh, next step, and that's the most important step in, in quality control, is catching errors. An error in Mandoc language means um, either there is a serious risk that content gets lost, or there is a serious risk that Formatting is completely garbled and looks really bad. So you run mandoc tlint in the error mode. And uh, almost always need, you need to fix anything that shows up there. In a, in a good quality code base, it will be very little. In a bad quality code base, you can have several errors per manual page on average. It really depends. The typical types are unencoded non-ASCII characters in input. Those are obviously um, syntax errors and unportable. Graph, by the way, doesn't report that. It just does whatever happens with it. Unknown or mistyped macro names. Very dangerous because usually unknown macros are just ignored. Igno um, including the arguments, which is information loss. Then blocking errors, like opening a block, never closing it again. Closing a block that was never opened, and such stuff. And uh, severe issues with, with arguments. If there are macros with 
which are lacking essential arguments so that they don't work at all, or if there are excess arguments that may contain important information but are ignored because the macro doesn't support so many arguments, those are errors. So if you see errors, fix them. Final step, once you have cleaned up all the errors, run mandoc tlint again without any minus w argument. Then it will report everything it considers problematic. Um, in a low quality tree, expect lots of output. Um, in a good quality tree, so for example, the OpenBSD um, section two manuals, the system call manuals, that, that's about 150 manuals or so, have grand total 30 warnings or something like that. Um, you really can get a, um, a tree warning clean. There are sometimes a few false positives, so it's, it's usually good to fix most of them, but use your judgment. Do not blindly, just like with compiler warnings, do not blindly. There are various classes. Um, it's typically when stuff is used that doesn't completely garble formatting and doesn't lose information, but is uh, bad style or not quite portable for various reasons. Yeah. Um, by the way, all the messages you can you can expect are listed in the in the portable Mandoc manual itself. So one way to get that and to get explanations of the the messages is to just go to the to the Mandoc homepage. And here, look at the Mandoc manual. If uh, your operating system doesn't install the, the full manual, and here at the bottom, you have the list of all the, all the warnings. Uh, wrong one, sorry. Yeah. So now, on your tree, you have looked for fatal errors. Fix them right away. You have worked through all the usual errors, and finally you had a look at warnings and maybe fixed a few of them. There are a few other tools that I'll just mention briefly. Um, in NetBSD, they have been using the tool mdoclint, written by Thomas Klausner, with, for a long time, it's quite similar to mandoc.tlint, so it also focuses on catching syntax errors. It used to have, it used to catch additional errors that Mandoc didn't catch, but most of these have been integrated into Mandoc during the last few months. So it's not, it, it may sometimes find a bit more, but it also has a, a, a much higher noise, noise to signal ratio. So, that's more for, if you want to be very careful, you can use that too. It, it should, it's written in Perl, it should basically work everywhere. In NetBSD, there is a port, in OpenBSD, it's in the regression suits. Um, to run that one, just give the names of the file you want to check on the command line. And you usually don't le need options except to suppress me uh, messages you don't want. Yeah, um, a quite useful tool comes from FreeBSD. It was written by Warren Block. It has a, a quite different focus. It doesn't know so much about syntax, but it finds surprisingly many bad spellings and uh, instances of bad styles. So it has some kind of very simple artificial intelligence, I'd say. Well. Not really, but a bit in that direction. He named it Igor um, because he thinks it's a useful sermon, like the ego in Frankenstein. Um, it is available both in FreeBSD and OpenBSD as a port. And the way of using it is exactly the same as for m.lin. Just give the file names. And if it's too noisy, you can 
shut it up a bit by using command line options. Uh, so that's really a, a good thing to run after mandoc tlint if you, if you want to. Yeah, and finally, well, it's probably most of you won't do that. In the mandoc repository, there's a very s simple cell shell script to actually compare the output of mandoc against the output of graph. That's most useful for finding formatter bugs, but sometimes what you, when you have a lot of experience, it can also be used to find constructions that are less portable. I'm just mentioning it. It's probably more advanced. <laughs>